Hi everyone and welcome to the chapter 12 lecture for medical terminology. This chapter is all about the male reproductive system. So it goes very well with chapter 11, the urogenital system, and also feeds right into chapter 13 about the female reproductive system or gynecology. So the study of the female reproductive system does get its own sort of special medical term, gynecology, the study of females. Male reproductive system does not. If it did, it would be andrology, andro being a combining form that means male. Um, but either way, reproductive is technically a medical term. It comes from word parts that mean pertaining to producing again and again, which is what the reproductive system does. It produces gametes that can fuse to form um, a fertilized egg and to grow offspring. So um, and that's the reproductive system. So before we get into the study of the reproductive system, I want to use the word of the day to clarify some terms, the difference between sex and gender, first of all. So sex is your um, determined by your genitalia and to some extent by your genetics. So sex is determined by genitalia. Gender is determined by the brain. Most of the time, the brain and the genitalia match. And in those people, we refer to them as cisgender. So the terms of the day are cisgender and transgender. So cisgender means that your brain and your genitalia match. And transgender means that your brain and your genitalia don't match. Um, <clears throat> and so I'm just going to show you this quick video to show you that that it's not when I say that the brain and the genitalia don't match or do match for that matter I'm not talking about it being like all in one's head it's not psychological it is actually physical structure and biology of the brain that differs between males and females This video. I was at school. The principal told me that I had to leave completely and that I couldn't come back unless I changed my hair. With the wonderful Laverne Cox rising to fame and Bruce Jenner's groundbreaking interview, transgender issues are finally making it mainstream. So naturally, we're going to science this up. Hi everyone, Julia and Julian here for D News. Transgender means a person identifies as a gender other than what they were assigned at birth. Cisgender, on the other hand, are those who identify as the same gender they were assigned at birth. Unfortunately, being trans is a much more difficult path than being cis. Transgender individuals face a world filled with violence, erasure, and ignorance. But by being true to themselves, they open up a road for so many others to follow. Still, why would anyone purposefully subject themselves to a life of difficulty? Well, it's not a choice. It's who they are, and science can back that up. One study published in the Journal of Neuroscience identified networks in the brain associated with gender. Using diffusion-based magnetic resonance tomography imaging, the researchers looked at the brains of people who are transgender as well as female and male controls. They found microstructures or connections to the brain that differed significantly between the male and female subjects. However, the networks in the brains of those who identified as transgender seemed to take up a middle position. The researchers also found a link between these networks and the amount of testosterone in the bloodstream, suggesting that sex hormones affect how these structures form in the brain, which is supported by earlier research. Right. Some regions of the brain show difference based on gender. In one study published in the Journal of Psychiatric Research, scientists used MRI techniques to scan the brains of 18 people who were assigned female but identify as male, and 24 male and 19 female heterosexual controls. The researchers found that the white matter of female to male individuals who received no hormone therapy more closely resembled brains of the male subjects than the female subjects. Another study by that same research group, also published in the Journal of Psychiatric Research, focused on those who were assigned male at birth but identified female. The researchers used similar techniques as the other study and found that their white matter microstructures fell between the measurements of male and female subjects. One of the authors of the study concluded, their brains are not completely masculinized and not completely feminized, but they still feel female. And if it's a matter of brain wiring, a lot of kids would know early, and they do. In one study published in the Graduate Journal of Social Science found that 76% of participants knew they were transgender before they left elementary school. A small study published in the journal Psychological Science 
found that kids as young as five who identify as trans showed a consistency in gender identity across various measures. I actually saw Laverne Cox speak at an event at Rutgers and she said exactly the same thing. The researchers asked 32 transgender kids aged 5 to 12 questions about gender and under the implicit association test to see how kids identify with various things. Using the IAT, the researchers could see how quickly the kids associated gender with the concepts of me and not me. It's a fast test, so they don't have a lot of time to think about it, they just respond. The researchers found that the kids' responses were indistinguishable from their cisgendered peers. The transgender girls responded the same as cisgender girls, and the transgender boys responded just like the cisgender boys. The researchers concluded that their study provided clear evidence to support that transgender children are not confused, delayed, pretending, or oppositional. They instead show responses entirely typical and expected for children with their gender identity. We know that gender is a complex and varied issue. Even Facebook recognized that reality. To learn more about that, check out this video right here. So in addition to a variety of new trans options, including so it there they speak very quickly but they do refer to several studies that have shown that the brain structure the physical structure the cellular structure of the brain is different in males and females and those who identify as a certain gender tend to have a brain structure that matches that gender or is closer to that gender than the other so it really leads some scientific credence to this concept that gender identity is a spectrum that there is such a thing as a female brain structure and a male brain structure and it's also possible to have a sort of in-between structure and so it's not well understood how this happens because it's hard to study the brain in utero like in a in a fetus and, and brain development because it's kind of unethical <laughs> to kill babies to look at their brains but um, what we know from from mice studies and, and rat studies in labs is that um, the brain becomes genderized in utero when it is exposed to different levels of hormones that are produced and so different exposure levels to hormones that is being produced in utero can change the development of the brain early on and cause it to not match the the sex of the genitalia so interesting stuff and now you know where transgender and cisgender come from the term cis means same and trans means opposite alrighty so now for some anatomy of the male reproductive system alright so we can see this is similar from the images in the previous chapter when we're looking at the urinary system so here's the bladder all right, but the male reproductive system parts include, we'll start here with the testes. The testes are the male gonads. They produce the gametes, the um, sperm. And then there is the epididymis, which is a structure that sits on top of the testes where the sperm go to mature. Then they get sent to the seminal vesicle through this long tube called the vas deferens. So the vas deferens is kind of like similar in um, its purpose as the ureter. It's just carrying the product of the testicles to the next part of the system. The storage tank of this system is the seminal vesicle. So the seminal vesicle also does make some seminal fluid that helps to provide nourishment and stabilizes the sperm. And then before ejaculation, or when ejaculation occurs, the, the sperm and the semen, the seminal fluid, leave the seminal vesicle, pass through the prostate where they pick up prostate fluid, and they pass into the urethra, pass another gland called the bulbourethral gland, which also secretes fluid. And then they pass through the urethra, so they pass through the same tube to exit the penis as urine does. Um, and then, of course, they exit through the penis. Notice here in this picture, too, that here's the bones of the spine, right? Okay. There are no bones in the penis. Humans do not have a baculum, a penis bone. But what there is is this um, erectile tissue. So you can see it here in pink and then in kind of like this other tannish color. All right. Um, and the erectile tissue functions by filling or swelling and becoming engorged with blood increased blood flow so it's basically like controlled edema and um so i like to point out that there is no bone there 
Um, the sac of skin here that the testes are in is called the scrotum. And I'm pretty sure I've covered everything on this slide here, and we'll go through each part of the this reproductive system in the slides to follow. <clears throat> so we'll start with the testes. So the testes live in the scrotum. The scrotum is the term for the sac of skin that the testes are housed in. The, the organs themselves, which are sort of egg-shaped, um, are the testes. So the testes live in the scrotum and hang outside of the abdomen because they're very temperature sensitive. So it's actually important for the testes to be a couple of degrees cooler than the rest of the body in order for sperm development to occur properly. That's why the male testes are outside of the body rather than inside of the body. It's also why the scrotum contracts and relaxes at different temperatures. It's all an effort to keep the sperm at the right temperature for development. Um, it, in fact, it's uh, one of the things that can lead to infertility or fertility issues in men is spending too much time in hot tubs. Um, heating up their testes too much can mess with their uh, sperm development. So the testes themselves are the organ that actually produces the reproductive cells, the sperm. We call these organs gonads. Gono means seed. So the female gonads are the ovaries, the male gonads are the testes. The testes are also part of the endocrine system because they produce hormones. The main hormone they produce is testosterone. Um, literally a steroid hormone, sterone, that is made by the testes. So it's made in very high quantities by the testes. It's also made, we'll see, in females. Even though they don't have testes, they do make testosterone. They just make it in much smaller quantities. So some fun etymology for us. Um, the two combining forms for the testes are testiculo and orchio. So testiculo and testi may be familiar to you as a word part in a common English term to testify, right? So that actually is the same combining form. And the reason we use it is because in ancient uh, Rome, uh, in legal the legal system, when you were testifying as a witness, you had to swear that you were telling the truth. Nowadays, we swear on the Bible. But in those days, men, men were the only ones who were allowed to serve as witnesses. Women were not credible. But um, men would have to swear on their, on their family jewels, their testicles. So to testify is to actually swear on your testes. So um, that's where the Latin term testiculo comes from. It actually means witness. And then orchio is the Greek combining form for testes, and um, it comes from the word orchid, a type of flower. So when I first started teaching this class and I learned that I was thinking, when I was thinking orchids, I was thinking like Asian orchids that are very like flowery and don't look anything like testicles. So I thought either the ancient Greeks had some really interesting looking testicles or they had really interesting looking orchids. Um, and then I was hiking in the Adirondacks and I spotted one of these. Oops, my head's in the way. All right, a pink lady slipper. And you just cannot deny the resemblance there of that flower to a testicle. So I'm imagining the Greeks had a similar orchid and the pink lady slipper is in the orchid family. So I imagine this is the type of orchid that they named the testes after. So the testes, I'm going to move my face right over here, all right, are the, there's a structure on top of the testes called the epididymis. So if we actually cut the testes open and look at them, we would actually see that there's a series of tubules. They're called the seminiferous tubules. And that is where the sperm are actually made. So let's zoom in on a seminiferous tubule. We see these cells here. These are sort of like stem cells that give rise to sperm. We call them spermatocytes. They are these sperm 
cells, progenitor cells. And then you can see they mature into the actual sperm, which are like little swimming things. They look kind of like little animals. So they're called spermatozoan. Zoan means animal, like zoo is where you go to see animals, zoology, the study of animals. So spermatozoan is the sort of animal looking stage of the sperm, the mature stage. So this, then these mature sperm um, swim through the tubules, through the lumen of the seminiferous tubules to this other tubular structure here of folded tubes, which is the epididymis. And in the epididymis, the sperm get what I like to call their swim cap. This thing here, the acrosome, that looks literally like they're wearing a swim cap, right? It contains enzymes that help to break through and fertilize the egg once it reaches there. Also contains um, components, buffer components to help um, keep the pH of the vagina um, uh, amenable to the survival of the sperm, all right? The tail of the sperm um, is just the propeller, all right? But the head of the sperm is where all the cellular material, the DNA is. The tail is just a protein propeller. But this swim cap, this acrosome is very important for the sperm to be able to fertilize the egg, which is really the whole purpose of them. So um, another thing that happens in the epididymis is the epididymis sort of deletes any sperm that are malformed. So if they're not formed properly or they don't have a swim cap, they will get pulled and um, deleted, essentially, um, degraded. And then ultimately, the epididymis turns into this long tube that we call the vas deferens. So just before I leave this slide, a little bit of um, etymology. Epi means upon or above, and didymo means twin structures. You have Males have two testes, so they are twin structures. So didymo is another term, I guess we could add to that previous slide, about testes. Um, so the epididymis is upon the testes, above or upon the testes. So sperm is made in the seminiferous tubules of the testes. It is matured and edited and gets its swim cap on in the epididymis and then it goes through the vas deferens which is just a long tube that carries the sperm to the seminal vesicle so the vas deferens is similar in, in function to the esophagus to the ureter all right its purpose is just to transport something from one organ where it's produced to the next organ um, so the vas deferens oops, i'm going to move my face over here because i have some words showing up. So the vas deferens is this long tube. Deferens um, means to carry away. So the vas deferens is a vessel that carries. Um, the vas deferens is also what gets cut in someone who has a vasectomy. A vasectomy literally means the surgical removal of the vas deferens. It's not the whole vas deferens. Usually they just take out like an inch or something, a small section, and then seal the ends. So the someone who has a vasectomy is still producing sperm. It's just not able to get carried to the seminal vesicle. So there's a blockage there. They still produce sperm. And so vasectomies can be reversed by reattaching that vas deferens and reopening that pathway. Um, the seminal vesicle here is what produces most of the seminal fluid. So again, going back to someone who has a vasectomy, they still ejaculate semen because most of the semen, seminal fluid comes from the seminal vesicle and the prostate gland and the bulbourethral gland. Those are still connected. Um, it just lacks the actual sperm. So uh, when somebody, when a male ejaculates, the semen from the seminal vesicle flow through this ejaculatory duct here, which fuses with the urethra. And then it travels through the urethra out of the urethral meatus, the, the opening. Sorry for the background noise. My cat is exploring the room. Um, <clears throat> so we said that the penis does not have a bone. There's no baculum in a human penis. 
but there is erectile tissue. So the two types of erectile tissue on the lateral sides of the penis, we have the corpora cavernosa. And on the ventral side of the penis, we have the corpus spongiosum. So corpora cavernosa and corpus spongiosum are just two types of erectile tissue. They swell and become engorged with ex excessive blood flow. I have my little Harry Potter wand here because I think that those tissues sound kind of like Harry Potter spells. I mean, you can kind of imagine going corpora cavernosa. And I feel like erection through, um, uh, what's the word, through hemodilation, all right, through engorgement, through blood causing dilation of the tissue is kind of seems magical than, more magical than a bone, I suppose. Um, so that's my Harry Potter joke for you. The outside of the penis is covered by some loose skin that hangs over the head of the penis or the glans penis as it is called. And it is called the foreskin in layman's terms, but medical terms, it's called the prepuce. So um, people who have a circumcision, what happens is they remove the prepuce. And this is something that's largely cultural. So circumcision is done in certain religions like Judaism. It's a religious practice that happens eight days after the birth of a male. In some um, countries, it has been done, practiced as an act of hygiene. In the US, it was done very commonly as uh, in the, I don't know, 80s, 90s, it was in incredibly common. It was recommended by doctors to promote gut hygiene because what can happen in a male is that debris and um, just, you know, dirt and, and secretions can get built up in the prepuce if it's not cleaned and washed properly, and then that can lead to infection. So um, it was thought to be more hygienic. Uh, honestly, it's, it, there's really no difference as long as, as um, one takes proper hygienic measures to clean the oneself, there's really no difference. Um, and so more and more it's become, it's become a less common practice in the U.S. to circumcise males only at the request of the parents. And in some circles, it is actually a highly debated form of, you know, some people debate whether it's even ethical to circumcise uh, a male baby with, that, to alter their body without their consent. Um, but anyway, this is what a circumcised penis looks like versus an uncircumcised penis with the prepuce or foreskin sk still intact. So that process of removing it is called a circumcision, literally means to cut around. So what you're doing is you're cutting around the skin around the glands penis to remove it. Now there is one medical condition where circumcision is the treatment for it, and that is something called phimosis that we'll get to. But in phimosis, the foreskin opening is very small. And so when the penis becomes erect, when a, when a male penis becomes erect that has a foreskin, the glans penis pokes out of the foreskin, so the penis um, elongates. But in somebody with phimosis, the penis can't make it through the foreskin. It's like too tight. I think of it as like a turtleneck that's too tight. You can't get your head through. And so in that case, there is a medical need for a circumcision. So a little bit about the physiology of sperm production. Sperm production is called spermatogenesis, the generation of sperm. And it begins at the onset of puberty. So male children do not produce sperm. They have spermatocytes in their testes, but they don't develop into spermatozoa until the proper hormones are being produced. And that occurs at puberty. And puberty starts in the brain. So the pituitary gland in the brain starts to secrete two very important hormones, follicle stimulating hormone or FSH and luteinizing hormone. LH. And these are the same hormones that in, induce female puberty as well. So these, these are puberty inducing hormones coming from the brain and they stimulate the gonads. So the two things, the things they do that the way they're different is FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, actually stimulates the spermatocytes to develop into sperm. 
and luteinizing hormone stimulates the hormone production by the gonad. So in the case of, the, of males, it stimulates testosterone production by the testes. So the testes, um, it's a different set of cells in the testes. So the spermatocytes don't secrete testosterone. Spermatocytes become sperm. The cells in between the spermatocytes are the interstitial cells, inter meaning between, they are the ones that actually produce the testosterone. So follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the actual maturation of those sperm cells. In females, we'll see it stimulates maturation of eggs. And luteinizing hormone stimulates hormone production um, by the gonads. In males, it's testosterone. In females, we'll see it's largely estrogen. So in males, the male hormone testosterone stimulates all of the sexual maturity things that we see with sexual maturity the physical developments associated with it so testosterone in, in, influences sex drive in the brain so there are testosterone receptors in the brain it increases or it stimulates hair follicles to produce hair thicker hair in certain areas in the face the chest genitals the underarms um, it stimulates growth of the Adam's apple, of the larynx, and so it changes the voice, male voice. It also cycles back and stimulates more sperm production, so it signals itself. And it also stimulates growth and development of the external genitalia. So lots of things that testosterone does, and it's really the reason that the male body physically changes during puberty. So in order to fertilize an egg, that sperm has to exit the body and enter the female body in order to get to the egg to fertilize it. So um, the process of that, the physiology of that, is through erection and ejaculation. So the male penis becomes erect through vasodilation. So the process of blood flowing to the tissue and dilating, so the blood vessels dilate which allows fluid into the erectile tissue and leads to engorgement. Um, and this can happen through uh, either physical touch or thoughts that initiate this process. Ejaculation is when the sperm is actually uh, emitted from the urethra. So this can happen it, this happens through a series of contractions that occur in muscle at the base of the penis. And ejaculation literally means to like violently propel. So um, it is how the penis ejects sperm and seminal fluid. And it comes through the urethra, right? Through the same um, vessel that carries urine and out the opening, which remember is called the urethral meatus. So that is all of the anatomy and physiology that you need to know regarding the male reproductive system. Now for some diseases and conditions. The first one is called cryptorchism or cryptorchidism. So cryptorchidism is the longer term, but it, there's sort of a shorter term, cryptorchism, and one of your pronunciation spelling words, I believe. So crypto means hidden. So cryptorchism is a disease, a specific disease of hidden testes. And it's more commonly known as um, undescended testicles. So during fetal development, the testes start up here, basically the same place that the ovaries are. So all uh, fetuses really start with ovaries. And if there's a lot of testosterone production, because it's a male, then those testes, or sorry, those ovaries start to descend in the abdominal cavity and into the inguinal canal, all right, and become testes. And so this process occurs, this is a where it is in a five month fetus, a seven month fetus, and a newborn, they should be fully descended. Um, one of the things doctors will do in male newborns is check that their testes have dropped. Sometimes they drop a little bit after birth. Um, but if they fail to drop within a certain amount of time after they are born, they may be surgically descended. Uh, they may do a procedure called an orchiopexy, a procedure to fix the testes into their proper place. 
Um, again, it's important for them to be located outside of the body in the scrotum rather than internally because of that the temperature regulation that's important for sperm development. So um, I think even up until you know ch early childhood they might wait for those the testes to drop before surgically fixing them because it, it's only really important once they hit puberty that those testes are descended but also the younger you do surgery the less traumatizing it is for for individuals so uh, I have to look up what age that surgery is most common um, but okay so that's cryptorchism Another condition that can occur affecting the testes is just a broad condition of infertility. So infertility is an inability to conceive a child. And usually a couple is diagnosed with infertility until the individual who's, whose reproductive system is not functioning properly is identified. And so a male who has infertility could have many different problems. It could be due to oligospermia, which oligo, remember, means few or scanty. So this is a condition of scanty sperm production. So they make sperm, but they just don't make a lot of them. So this grid system is a microscope slide that's used to count things. So on the left here, we have maybe someone with a normal sperm count. And on the right, we have someone with a more sparse sperm count with oligospermia. So males ejaculate millions of sperm, um, takes a lot of sperm to ultimately have one that makes it all the way to the egg and fertilizes it. So fewer sperm just means fewer chances, fewer odds of getting fertilization. And so um, someone with oligospermia may still be able to conceive naturally, but the it's just a lot harder. Um, and things like spending too much time in a hot tub can contribute to oligospermia. Testicular, uh, oh, other things that can cause infertility, um, aspermia, someone who doesn't produce sperm at all. Um, a vasectomy is intentionally causing infertility. Um, there can also be problems with the motility of the sperm. So maybe a male produces plenty of sperm, but they um, are not able to swim properly, or maybe they have a defunct acrosome. So they have lots of sperm and they swim great, but they get to the egg and they just can't fertilize it because they don't have those enzymes necessary. So there's a lot of different deformations or malformations of sperm that can lead to infertility, oligospermia being one of them. Another condition is testicular cancer, cancer of the testes. So this is kind of a unique one because most cancers um, are have an increased risk as we age. So beyond 40 really is when the, the risk for many cancers becomes higher. There's a couple of cancers, uh, blood cancers, leukemias that are common in childhood. And then there's testicular cancer, where the most common age of diagnosis for testicular cancer is like in the 20s, like late teens, early 20s to mid 30s is like the peak range for diagnosis of testicular cancer. So it's very important for young men to do regular examinations of their testes to feel for hard tumors because it's not a, a cancer that's associated with age, increased age. It's actually one that's more highly associated with younger men. Prostate cancer, however, is more common as men age, and it's one of the more treatable cancers, prostate cancer. Testicular cancer is often treated through surgical removal of the testes, and prostate cancer can sometimes be treated through chemotherapy without removal of the prostate, but it can be treated with removal of the prostate. Other diseases and conditions, any kind of infection remember is going to have the suffix itis and an infection or inflammation. So infection or inflammation of any part of the uh, various parts of the male reproductive system, epididymitis would be um, inflammation of the epididymis, orchitis, inflammation of the testes, prostatitis, inflammation of the prostate, and balanitis, balano is a combining form for penis. Another combining form for, for penis that I don't have in this lecture, but you should know, is phallo, P-H-A-L-L-O. Um, 
a lot of times things that have a penis like shape are described as phallic right phallo is another combining form for a penis um, some other conditions that we have here about really that have to do with erection so cordy is a condition of curvature of the penis during erection so normally the penis should be straight when it's erect but in some people it's slightly curved um, it can be uncomfortable it's often associated with people who have hypospadias or epispadias so it's a shortened urethra um, and an improper urethral meatus opening so um, the what makes it difficult can make it difficult to have intercourse when the penis is curved when the vaginal canal is straight it makes for a mismatch in anatomy there um, erectile dysfunction or ed is an inability to obtain or maintain an erection in order to have successful intercourse so it is a failure of that process of vasodilation of engorgement so one of the treatments for erectile dysfunction is a drug called viagra and there's also uh, generic forms of it uh, interesting story about the discovery of viagra it is a vasodilator and vasodilation does lead to erections but also vasodilation on a systemic level in the body leads to a drop in blood pressure so viagra was actually a drug that they were studying to treat high blood pressure they were they were studying it as a uh, like a heart medication to treat people with chronic hypertension and they did a trial and they you know gave the drug to different people tested whether it helped their blood pressure and it wasn't really very successful as a blood pressure medication so they ended the trial and they were like everyone give back your extra meds and they found that the male participants were really who had the the, the um the actual drug not the placebo were really hesitant they wouldn't give back the extra medication they really insisted on keeping it and then they did a little more um you know questioning and found out that there was this side effect it had this side effect of giving them erections and they liked that so the drug companies just got creative and thought oh let's just remarket this drug not use it as a blood pressure medication but use it to treat erectile dysfunction there's a handful of drugs that have been found through this serendipitous you know way where they were treat testing it as a treatment for one thing and found out that it had this side effect that was actually desirable and they remarketed it and so um, that is how viagra works it increases vasodilation so it also can cause drops severe drops in blood pressure that can be a side effect um, another side effect that can happen is called priapism priapism is a prolonged and often painful erection this can happen in people who take it recreationally who don't actually have erectile dysfunction but take it to have a longer or bigger erection and they end up with too long or too big of an erection so priapism it can be very uncomfortable in fact sometimes it has to be met like people will end up at the hospital to have it actually drained through like basically taking a needle and sucking out at the excess fluid so you know careful with recreational use of vasodilators premature ejaculation is ejaculating before um, penetration of the female so the purpose of sexual intercourse in you know um, evolutionary terms is to fertilize the egg so if a male cannot achieve fertilization if they cannot maintain an erection and and hold off ejaculating inside the female to get um, fertilization then that is known as premature ejaculation um, some other conditions pertaining to sex is dyspareunia dyspareunia means a condition of abnormal or painful intercourse peruno is a combining form that means intercourse so pain during intercourse is not so much a condition as it is a symptom of other conditions um, sexually transmitted infections different um, stds or stis can cause dyspareunia pain during sex um, pain after sex is called postcoital pain and this can be from something even as simple as just chafing 
So balanitis, inflammation of the penis, can occur if like, not enough lubricant is used, and that can lead to postcoital pain, pain after sex. Coito is another term for intercourse. Coitus, you may have heard that term. Sexually transmitted infections, STIs, is the current um, term of choice. Also, a little bit outdated but still used commonly is STDs, sexually transmitted diseases. The older term from like maybe the 80s and 90s and be before that was venereal disease. So venereo, ven vino, comes from the Greek goddess of love, Venus. So venereo is also a combining form for sexual intercourse. So we've got three different combining forms for sexual intercourse. Um, so the most, the most common term today is STI, sexually transmitted infection, but you still may have doctors who refer to it as STDs or even as VD, venereal disease. So there's a number of different STIs, um, and we'll talk about them on this slide. So um, one that is particularly um, pandemic, I guess, the last big pandemic of our time was in the 1980s and 90s when AIDS um, came into really became a pandemic. AIDS is the disease. It's called acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. It's caused by the virus HIV, human immunodeficiency virus, which spread worldwide in the 1980s and now is with us and is something that we have learned to treat with drugs and keep under control but we haven't really found a cure for it yet that so we are very very close um, and the cure is is complicated it involves um, transferring t cells so it would be it's not like a drug that or a vaccine that we could administer wide scale it's something that would be expensive and be um, uh, individual to each individual so that's hiv that causes aids immunodeficiency syndrome chlamydia is actually the most common sexually transmitted infection it's often asymptomatic so people don't know they have it and then they can transmit it to others it's treatable with antibiotics though um, another very common one that's very similar to chlamydia is gonorrhea so they both have similar symptoms pain or stinging during urination pelvic pain but again they both can oft also be asymptomatic Gonorrhea literally means flow of seed. It's often referred to as a genital discharge disease, so it does cause increased discharge. So that's what that rhea, gonorrhea, that extra flow of seed of, of genital discharge. Herpes simplex virus, HSV1 and HSV2, cause genital herpes. They lead to um, lesions on the genitalia that are painful and also serve to spread the virus. All herpes viruses, it's my cat and dog at the door, um, all herpes viruses have this ability to go dormant. So once you are infected with a herpes virus, you always have that herpes virus in your body. We saw this um, back in the skin chapter with chicken pox and shingles. The chicken pox shingles a virus, the herpes varicella zoster virus, is a herpes virus. So you get an initial infection, causes these skin lesions, and then it lays dormant in your nerves and it can um, re emerge. And so um, that's genital herpes as well. So there are medications that you can take to help keep that herpes virus dormant, but once you have it, you always have it. Um, HPV, human papillomavirus, is a family of viruses. It causes skin warts, so we also saw that in Chapter 7. We talked about the integumentary system, but there are also strains that can cause genital warts and strains that can cause cervical cancer and other types of cancer, so strains that can cause cancer, basically mucosal cancers, so of the cervix, but also of the anus, of the throat and mouth. Um, and so there is a vaccine for HPV. We do not have a vaccine for herpes simplex virus or for HIV, though many people have tried to develop one for these diseases to no avail. 
but there is a vaccine to HPV that came out in 2006. It's one of the newest vaccines, and it is highly effective at preventing the strains of HPV that cause genital warts and cervical cancer. So in essence, it is a cancer vaccine because HPV, really the most severe disease it causes, is cancer. So getting a vaccine for it, it's actually our, our first real vaccine against a type of cancer. So I strongly encourage you to get it if you have not, um, and to have your kids get it as well. My Both of my teenage boys have gotten theirs, and my daughter will get hers when she's old enough. Syphilis is a sexually transmitted infection that's caused by a, a bacteria that can, can sort of hide in the body and cause chronic disease. It's very treatable in the early stages with antibiotics, but if it goes untreated, it can lead to sort of systemic problems, including brain problems, neurological problems that basically cause dementia, a form of dementia. But the early signs of it is a painless chanker. All right, it looks like the word canker, but it's actually pronounced shanker in this case. And it's like a lesion on the genitals. It looks like a blister, but it's not painful. And so sometimes what can happen is people see it and they intend to get it checked out, but it, it's not really causing any pain, and then it goes away. And so they never end up getting, getting it checked because they think, oh, whatever it was, it didn't bother me, and now it's gone. All right, but if you ever see something like that, that is actually cause for concern and to see a doctor because it could be a sign of syphilis at a very early and treatable stage. Alrighty, so some other conditions. Benign prostatic hypertrophy. This, okay, benign means that it's not cancerous. Prostatic, pertaining to the prostate. Hypertrophy, overdevelopment. So the prostate, remember, it wraps around the urethra. And so if it becomes overdeveloped, all right, it can squeeze or squish that urethra and sort of smother it. And that can cause pain and discomfort during urination. So it's very treatable. It's benign, but it's also similar to the symptoms that one might get if you have prostate cancer. Gynecomastia is a condition of female-like breasts, so oh, enlargement of the breasts in a male. This can be due to hormone irregularities in a male. It can also be due to side effects of medications that they are taking, so gyne gynecomastia is um, male breast development. And then phimosis is one I was speaking about earlier, where the, like the turtleneck, where the foreskin, is, the opening of the foreskin is too small and the penis can't fit through. So it's a condition of being closed too tightly. Fimo means tightly. And osis is a condition. So the treatment for phimosis is circumcision. Some diagnostic procedures in the male reproductive system. Looking for prostate-specific antigen, PSA. So prostate-specific antigen is a high levels of it in the blood um, are indicative of prostate cancer. So it's basically a blood test that can look for prostate cancer. So testing the blood for PSA. Um, semen analysis can be done if somebody's having trouble, if couples having trouble conceiving. They can do semen analysis to look for um, issues with morphology, the shape of the sperm, and also motility issues, and also just numbers, sheer numbers. Um, ultrasonography, using an ultrasound or a sonogram to look at structures like the testes. A digital rectal exam is commonly practiced at male annual appointments to look for prostate swelling. So the prostate can be felt through the rectum. Let's go back and find a picture. Um, kind of go back pretty far here. Yeah. Okay, so we go back here. You can see here's the anus and the rectum. All right, and here's the prostate. So by sticking their fingers up the rectum, doctors can feel for the prostate. And so it's slightly invasive, but it's very simple, can be done in the doctor's office and um, can is, be, is a very effective way to look for prostate cancer and to examine the prostate. So digital, meaning fingers, and rectal, meaning the rectum, that's how that exam is 
performed, digital rectal exam. Biopsy is a procedure to take a piece, a cutting of a tissue in order to look at it under a microscope. So um, the testes or the prostate might be biopsied if cancer is suspected. Um, or also like if it's removed because of suspected cancer, they may also send it for a biopsy to look at it under a microscope as well. Some medical and surgical procedures that can be performed for the male reproductive system. Circumcision, of course, to cut the, remove the prepuce, the foreskin, by cutting around. An orchiectomy would be a surgical removal of the testes, maybe in the case of, of cancer, of testicular cancer. An orchiopexy, procedure to fix the testes in place if they are undescended. So if somebody has cryptorchism, they may need to have an orchiopexy. A prostatectomy, removal of the prostate in the case of someone who has prostate cancer potentially. Um, if they have benign prostatic hypertrophy, BPH, they may just need resection of the prostate. So something called a TERP, a transurethral resection of the prostate, which does not look comfortable, but they are under general anesthesia. So they stick a tool through the urethra. And so here's someone with with BPH, so the prostate is enlarged and it's pinching the urethra, which makes urination difficult and painful. And so this TERP procedure sort of widens that, um, that tube and, and carves out some of that prostate to relieve that swelling and allow for free passage of urine. Um, a TERP, transurethral, it goes through the urethra resection, so sort of cutting away, of the prostate. And lastly, these medical and surgical procedures here. Um, so one can have a penile implant. That is an option for erectile dysfunction that is different from Viagra. So it does involve surgery. It is invasive. And I think the availability of erectile dysfunction medications, vasodilators like Viagra, have reduced this, but it used to be fairly common treatment for erectile dysfunction. In fact, one of my best friends who became a doctor when she was in medical school, in medical school, medical students do dissections of human cadavers um, in order to learn about human anatomy. And her cadaver was an elderly gentleman who, when they got to his genitalia, found that he had a penile implant. So it was like a little pump in that was inserted in the testes. And when, when he squeezed it, it like pumped like into the, there was like a tube, a deflated tube in the shaft of the penis. And when he pumped on this little, this little bulb in the testes, it would inflate that tube in the penis and lead to erection. So that's how the penile implants work. They can um, be inflated and deflated, similar to how erections work. If somebody wants to, a male wants to get birth control, basically the only available process or procedure for male birth control or male contraception that we have is a vasectomy. They are working on a hormonal drug, um, a pill that male, men can take, but currently um, the option is a vasectomy. So a vasectomy is pictured here. All right, so you can see the two vas deferens have both been cut. A small area has been removed. A small bit of the vessel has been removed. And then it has been stapled or tied off or cauterized at the ends. So that is what a vasectomy is. So they can still <clears throat> um, produce sperm in the testes, but it will not travel to the seminal vesicle. There's no way for it to be ejected. In the case of somebody who wants to have their vasectomy reversed, so fun fact, fun story for you, personal story. When I met my husband, he was divorced and had two kids and he had already had a vasectomy. He had had a marriage and he'd had kids and he felt like he, he was done with that. He never wanted to get married and have any more kids again. And then he met me and I was so special and that he wanted to marry me and I really wanted to have kids. So he went through a vasectomy reversal so that we could have our daughter and we do have a daughter. So it was a successful surgery, but it's a very, um, delicate surgery because the doctor has to literally go in and pull out this tube that's as thin as spaghetti 
and sew it back together. So they have to sew the lumen and then sew the inner part and then the outer part back together. So this is a very delicate pr procedure. You have to have really good steady hands and it's really the skill of the doctor that determines the success of the surgery. So my wonderful husband went through this procedure to have a vasovasostomy. That is the medical term for a vasectomy reversal. And he gives me permission to share that story as long as I share that he did it without general anesthesia. He had local anesthesia and he described it as having his testes slammed between two bricks, stung by a hundred bees, and lit on fire. I swear he didn't seem like he was in that much pain when it was happening, but that's what he claims that it was. So he doesn't recommend getting a vasectomy before you're absolutely sure that you don't want any more kids. Um, so that's a, a vasectomy and a vasovasostomy or a vasectomy reversal. Literally vasovasostomy means to, to make a, an opening between two ends of the vas. So you're taking these two vas ends and putting them back together. A vasovasostomy is a type of anastomosis. Remember, anastomosis from chapter five um, is taking two ends of a tube of a vessel and put it, reconnecting them. So if you have uh, surgery on a blood vessel and you have part of your blood vessel snipped out and the tubes are reconnected, that's an anastomosis. So vasovasostomy is an anastomosis of the vas deferens. And that is the end of chapter 12.